everyone, this is Gary Wilson, and welcome to tonight's live investor agent webinar. And welcome aboard to new students, veteran students, East Coast, West Coast, uh, Florida, Canada. Um, the way this works, if you're new to the program, the webinar is live. As you can tell, we're it's live and, and it is being recorded. So you get the good, the bad, and the ugly. Everything is completely unscripted, and you choose the subject. And what you do is to choose the subject is you simply email me. Uh, if there's something you want to discuss, email me, and the very next week we'll discuss that subject. We'll go into great detail. We won't we won't stop until all questions are answered. Okay. Um, also, everything everybody by default is is muted. It's just the way the system's designed. As you'd imagine, um, it would be kind of hectic if we had 100 people um, live trying to talk at the same time. However, I do and can unmute you from time to time. Okay. Um, sometimes we'll discuss something and everybody gets to hear the, the language or the conversation. Okay. Um, so in any case, let me go back here real quick and let's get started. So welcome aboard to everybody. If generally speaking, if you do have questions, you type them in your question box and we will cover them all before we stop for the evening. Sometimes it goes past the hour, but it's just uh, really what's, uh, it's what you guys want. So I don't mind, I'll stay on as long as you guys want to. Um, tonight's subject is this. A lot of people have, uh, they've heard me speak more about managing rentals. And it's, I know it sounds sometimes a rough as feathers because people say, well, I don't want to manage rentals, so here it's a big pain in the neck. And sometimes it can be. But I will tell you, I have never, ever been woken up in the middle of the night with a clogged toilet, ever, in 31 years. <laughs> okay? A lot of those things are just... Uh, you know, misinformation and uh, limiting beliefs. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Um, I'm just telling you if you, there's ways you can mitigate that stuff by having decent properties and doing a good job running them. Or sometimes you turn them over to other people and let them run them. But let's assume your, your clients are asking you if you can manage rentals for them and you over time you realize, man, 30 people have asked me. If I had said yes to all 30 of them, I'd have 30 owners they may have anywhere between four and nine units, for example. Okay, um, that's a pretty good cash flow. But it's not all just about the fees that you earn for managing the rentals. We're going to talk more about this later. There's at least 12 different ways uh, to make money managing rentals for others. At least 12. Okay. So, but let's go. Let's start at the beginning. The subject came up as a result of people asking about the lease, and the question was, "Hey, I have." I have clients who like to use their own contracts, and I will tell you this: I used to be one of those people. I was an investor before I was a broker. Okay, I was an agent first, then became a broker, and I would get all these this paperwork through other training courses and free stuff online. And when I got my license, I realized that was putting me at a disadvantage. So let me describe this to you real quickly, so you understand why I say that. Um, you, everybody has a board of real estate in your state or province, okay? And you also have local boards that are generally tied to your MLS system, okay? Now, <clears throat> they all have forms, standardized forms, that are not just written for us as agents. They also are obviously written for consumers. They're written to be neutral in nature. So in other words, they don't lean one way or the other. They're not, they're not uh, pro-owner. They're not pro buyer, they're not pro-tenant, they're pro-legal, and, and, and that doesn't mean that you can't provide advantages to your clients, whether they're owners or renters or sellers, whatever the case may be. We'll talk about that here more in a minute. The most important thing is this, though, guys. <clears throat> There's different laws uh, all across all 50 states and the 10 provinces in Canada, all right? Now, one of them is called the plain language law, all right? Um, it's a federal mandate, and plain language law says that any contract uh, has to be written in such a, such a way that it's plain language that the average person with a sixth grade education, reading or reading level, excuse me, sixth grade reading level can understand it and comprehend it, okay? So first challenge is this. If you take contracts off the Internet or that are not uh, offered by your board of real estate, they often do not meet the plain language laws of your of, of your of your state or province, okay, um, and there, and you'll know that because they have to go through scrutiny. They have to be scrutinized to meet the plain language laws. They have to be approved, and they will tell you 
this contract meets the, meets the plain language laws, right? That's just part of it. The other part of it is this. In every single state, all of the contracts for real estate, whether they're sales agreements, listing agreements, um, leases, what have you, are all pre-approved all the way up to the state Supreme Court level, okay? So that means they will stand the test of a legal challenge through the magistrate's levels, through the court of common pleas level, all the way up to the, the Supreme Court level, which is really important. And here's why. Let's say you walk in there. Let's say you have a hearing. You have a tenant. You, let's say you're evicting somebody. And you went to the magistrate. You filed your landlord tenant complaint. You had your case, and you won your case. That tenant can appeal. They can appeal to the court of common pleas, typically. All right. But regardless, let's say you go into into in front of the hearing, in front of the judge or magistrate, and you show up with one of these uh, leases that you got off the internet, or in the case of a sales a sale a sales agreement, you got off the internet. That judge has the authority to say, you know what? I don't recognize that lease. I'm not going to allow it to be entered. I don't recognize its language because it's not pre-approved all the way up to the state Supreme Court level. They can say that, and they often do, and I've had it happen. Okay, so and I'll give you an example in here in a minute. Uh, we're going to talk about an example of how devastating this can be. You might not think it's a big deal, but believe me, it can really be a big deal. Okay. Um, so first things first, always, always use a contract, whether it's a lease, a sales agreement, listing agreement, what have you, that is provided by your Board of Realtors and has been approved all the way to the state Supreme Court level. And they all have if they're offered by your state Board of Realtors. Okay, So that's the first thing. Now, does that mean that you can't do something to provide some advantage to your client? Let's say your client is the owner of a rental property. The answer is you absolutely can provide them an advantage. We're going to talk about that here in a second. So let me reduce the uh, panel here. Hang on one second. So I have more of my screen available. And hopefully everybody can see this. Let me, um, I don't want to expand it too much. I think it's okay the way it is. So let's just go through this, okay? We talked about the advantages, the advantage or reason why you want to have a state board of realtor approved contract. In this case, we're going to talk about Leases. So let's go and focus on leases, and you can see right there what happens if, if you go in there um, and you're not prepared with the right kind of document. You could literally have to be go back to ground one to, to ground zero, first base, and start all over again. Let's give an example of what I'm talking about here. All right? There's a famous case uh, that had to do with a an owner of a property that he was leasing to a Section 8 tenant. Okay, this happens in, in every state in the union, and believe it or not, there's people on subsidies up in Canada, too. They receive housing assistance. Okay, so I, and I actually knew this owner, and I was aware of the case. It was famous. Um, it was um, publicized, and um, people started teaching it, using this as a case study when they were teaching classes to uh, landlords and or investors and or realtors. So what happened is, I'll just give you the, the high-level view here. Landlord is renting an apartment to a tenant who was receiving a, a Section 8 subsidy, okay? Remember, the property is not Section 8. The tenant is Section 8. So they were required to use a Section 8 lease, which they did, okay? And this is going to ruffle some feathers here when you find out what happened. Uh, Section 8 the lease is, is uh, provided by your local Section 8 office, okay? It's not necessarily provided by HUD. It can be in some cases, but not always, okay? So what happens is this this landlord went to court to evict the tenant because they were not paying their portion of the rent and they were wrecking the apartment. Gets to court at the magistrate's level, the owner wins the case. So far, so good, right? Well, in most states, the loser of the case, whether it's plaintiff or defendant, can appeal that to the next highest court. And it's one of our privileges of being a citizen of the United States of America. And that's what this tenant did. He followed. He got an attorney and followed the advice of the attorney. They appealed it to the to the common pleas level. Went to arbitration, okay. Um, and the uh, the believe it or not, the land the landlord won there, okay. But court of common pleas has two levels. Basically, arbitration, where you try to solve things yourself and you're signing a document that says you're going to adhere to the um, findings and the recommendations. Uh, but you can appeal that. Well, this guy appealed it, 
it went to the judge, the, the district level judge. It went to the district level. Court of Common Pleas was in the district level. All right, gets in front of the judge, and the judge says, "Well, I'm not going to recognize this Section 8 lease. It doesn't. It doesn't adhere to. It's not pre-approved in our Supreme Court, all the way up to the Supreme Court in our state." And he was right. And that judge had the right to disallow that lease. And what that meant is that landlord had to go all the way back to the beginning at the magistrate's level and start all over again. And this had already been going on for over a year. And I remember, this guy's not getting his rent. Okay, he's not being paid his rent. This tenant is just getting a free ride. Um, now, had he had a, a lease that was... Uh, provided by and approved by his state board of realtors, he wouldn't have had this scenario happen at all. Okay, uh, when you get approved to the pre court level with these documents, the judges can't deny them; they have to allow them. They can't disallow them. So, in any case, uh, that's the first thing I want to go overnight. So, when you have your clients show up with these things or they're getting off the internet, just show them this case. Okay. Um, in any case, what you can do now, which is the next thing I want to show you, is this: you can add your own rules and regulations as a separate addendum to the main body of the lease, okay? Uh, and in your main body of the lease, you would say that so you would reference the addendum. You would say, please see attachment for rules and regulations, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. And I, I put an example here. This was the, these are the rules and regulations I used to use for all of my rentals, okay? And you could see, and by the way, the language in an addendum always overrides and supersedes the language in whatever uh, contract it's being attached to. That's the basic rule. So use of occupancy sounds kind of obvious, but we're, what we're saying is a tenant can only use and occupy the property as intended according to the lease, which is for them to live in there and not run a business out of there, not turning it into a daycare center or any kind of thing like that. Okay. Uh, we also get real specific on drugs and firearms. We actually explicitly do not allow them. In any of these violations, anybody that violates any of these rules and regulations are subject to eviction as, as a result of uh, that the lease, okay? Drugs, firearms, assignment, and sublease, we don't allow that. Um, I might approve it on a case-by-case -case basis, but as a general rule, contractually, we don't allow assignments or subleases. Okay, we don't allow them to alter the property in any way. They can't paint it. They can't do anything um, without our permission, okay? Okay. Um, Here's a good one, plumbing, all right? Now, when I lease an apartment, that apartment is leased with all the plumbing working in proper order. All the toilets flush, everything goes down, the sinks and the, and the, and the tubs and the showers all drain properly, the hot and cold water all work properly. So when I lease that unit, everything worked. Now, what I say in my <coughs> rules and regulations, <laughs> excuse me, is this that if something goes wrong with the plumbing, barring a supply line problem out, outside the house or a main sewer line problem outside the house, that the tenant is responsible for anything that happens inside the house. Um, you know, particularly if we can prove that, that they're responsible for, like shoving stuff down the toilet, okay, or dumping grease down uh, the kitchen sink. Those are all caused by the actions of the tenant and they've got to pay for the remedy of the, to the problem, okay? You put that in there. So water beds, we do not allow water beds. Um, pets, um, I will tell you later on, we actually do allow pets. So this right here tells you uh, that we have a pet policy that says no pets, but I'm gonna tell you what happened later on when it came to that policy. I figured out how to turn it into a profit center, which I'll describe later. Um, fire, hazard, fire hazard material, like fireworks, things like that, gasoline, can have. Obviously, tenants cannot change locks at all, ever, okay? Uh, they must report uh, dangerous and hazardous conditions. Um, everything they do must follow local, state, and, and uh, local county, state, and federal laws. They must keep the place clean. Uh, if, if they move in and it's clean, which it is, and it's obviously pest-free, and later on I discovered that there's pests there, um, rodents, insects, what have you. The tenant's responsible, not me, because when I gave them a property, it was pest-free. Um, chances are it's because of their living behavior, how they're, yeah, they're, their living lifestyle that's attracting these tenants, I mean, excuse me, these uh, insects or pests, all right? Noise, we'll always have noise uh, rules and regulations on noise. Um, 
you know, usually it's between the hours of 8 a.m. and uh, 10 p.m., okay? And on the weekends, it could go to 11 p.m. But basically, if they're disturbing neighbors, uh, they could be held liable for that and also be fined by the local authorities, actually. Okay, upkeep, upkeep of grounds, we go over that right out of the gate. We tell them, you know, if you're using the yard, you're responsible for the yard. They pick up the litter, they cut the grass, they do everything. The only exception is if I have a, a multi-unit building, like four units, um, I would generally pay a contractor to do yard work. From time to time, I might have the tenants take responsibility for different things. So, example, let's say I have a duplex. I might have one tenant take care of the yard, cutting or taking care of cutting the grass in the summer, and the other tenant take care of shoveling the snow in the winter. So what I'll do is I'll split the duties and responsibilities between the two tenants and tell them that's why we were able to keep our rents low. Otherwise, I'll farm that out and pay for it and then raise your rents to cover the cost. Um, in any case, we go over all that stuff. Uh, the tenants are also required to keep utilities on regardless. Um, and you also have to be um, identified and documented as a second notifiee. All right, so let's say they... They didn't pay their gas bill, the gas gets turned off, and you're living in Minneapolis, um, obviously your pipes can freeze, and that's you don't want to have that happen. So the tenant is required to keep the utilities on and in their name, and if for whatever reason they get turned off, excuse me, at least you're notified and you can get jump on the thing very quickly, all right? Um, in any case, uh, uh, tenants also um, may have overnight guests. But what we tell them is if they're there more than seven days, we're considering that a tenant and they need to do an application and pay deposit and pay rent and pay everything else, okay? Um, all right, let's let's um, let's do this. I want to save – well, let me – I'll go over this now. Let me just go over security deposits because it's a, it's a sensitive subject. Um, remember, I'm not an attorney, and I will tell you that there's a document you can get that, that describes the security laws, rules and regulations regarding um, – tenant security deposits in every single state. Some of them are familiar, they're similar, excuse me. Some of them are vastly different, okay? Uh, but we're gonna go, we're gonna, what I'll tell you is this, the basic fundamental rule of thumb is this. There was a, a Landlord-Tenant Act of 1957 that was created that, that all landlord-tenant law is basically based on in every state, okay? Um, and I'm willing to bet you that most landlord-tenant cases involve some, something that has to do with the security deposit. All right, the tenant messed the apartment up, moved out. The landlord kept some of the deposit to clean the place up. The tenant complained, went to court. All right. Um, in most cases, uh, if the owner is not prepared, if they did not provide pro proper documentation to follow the rules regarding security deposits in that in that uh, location, regardless of it doesn't matter what the tenant did, sometimes that the the judge will find in favor of the tenant simply because the landlord did not follow the rules and regulations surrounding and security deposits correctly. So just keep in mind, what I said there was this. Maybe you did everything correctly as a landlord as far as landlord goes, but if you didn't notify the, the tenant that you were keeping some of the deposit in writing and give them a description of, of why, and also a uh, photocopies of receipts um, for material that you had to pay for, or invoices paid the contractors. If you don't provide that, some states will say, well, you violated the, the, the law. You had to provide all that to the tenants so they can see what you used their security deposit to pay for. The reason this is important, guys, is this. Remember, that security deposit doesn't belong to you. You actually are acting as an escrow agent and keeping that security deposit at a safe place, safekeeping until such time that they move out of the apartment or whatever the rental is, okay? So keep that in mind. That's not your money. That's technically the owner's money. Um, I'm sorry, the tenant's money, okay? So a couple things are high level. You should Google and print your state's um, landlord tenant law. And if it doesn't have it in there, also Google and print the law that has to do with security deposits for rental properties, okay? A um, couple things here. If you violate these rules in a lot of states, uh, the tenant can claim not just the security deposit back, but they can collect or they can they can um, ask for and receive up to three times the security deposit amount. Okay, so this is really serious business. Um, 
couple other things about security deposits, guys, is that in some states there's a limit on how much you can collect. Okay, in some states there's not, but in the, in states where there are, you often can collect no more than the equivalent of one month of rent in the form of a security deposit. In other states, though, you can collect uh, first months and last months. Okay, uh, first months rent, last months rent, and also collect a, a security deposit. Okay, whatever your state allows, I would I would do the maximum. Okay. <clears throat> Now another thing we learn to do in different states is this. Let's say your state law says you can only collect the equivalent of one month's rent for what's called your, your security deposit for indemnity purposes. In other words, um, to clean up a mess or make a repair, that kind of thing. So what we instruct people to do is this. Have a separate cleaning deposit that's just for cleaning. Okay. And I would charge the equivalent of one half of a month's rent to pay for cleaning services. Um, so, in any case, that's one thing you can do to increase the amount of money that you're holding for this tenant um, should they decide to, to leave early or, or damage the place, okay? Without having to go to court, okay? If they, if they, uh, now, let me ref let me just qualify this for a second. Um, if somebody does move out on their own at some point during the term of the lease. And you can't find them. <laughs> you need to at least document that you tried to find them, to explain to them, remind them why you're keeping the deposit. Okay. So, in any case, back to the, what I was describing earlier. One month's rent should be for uh, damages, and another half month's rent you should collect in a separate security deposit for cleaning purposes. This is one way to um, um, hedge your bets and, and, and improve your position and reduce risk for you. By having these multiple deposits collected, okay, you just have to document them correctly. Um, I would also ask for last month's rent and keep that in place to pay the last month's rent because the reason is a lot of tenants will think, well, heck, I'll move out, you keep my deposit, and everybody's happy. Well, that's just not how it works. Let's say they do that, they don't pay last month's rent, you do keep their deposit, and they actually wreck the place. You're no further ahead because you only got money to pay for the last month, you don't have money to pay for the damages, okay? Um, not only that, most states will say, um, you you can't just take that deposit. You've got to go through the process of notifying them, and letting them know why you're keeping it and how to use it. Because the only and if they argue or fight you on it, the only person who can tell you that you can keep that deposit is the, the magistrate, the local judge. Okay. Um, by the way, you also want to collect the first month's rent and any security deposits all up front before you grant possession to a tenant. Don't ever just you know, they'll say they'll make your deposit and they'll call you up a week earlier and say, look, I know I'm not supposed to move until next Saturday, but I'd like to go ahead and move a few things in. Is that okay? Do not do it unless you collect a week's rent from them, uh, or excuse me, a full month's rent from them, and then you would prorate the last month by that extra week, okay? Always collect the full month rent up front and deposit all up front, okay? Now, a couple of the things about security deposits. Technically, they have to be held in an escrow account. Okay, so you're really you have to follow the escrow laws of your state, which is pretty serious business because if you violate those escrow laws, um, you're facing some pretty stiff penalties, right? But in any case, back to this. Um, at the end of the second year of a term, let's say a tenant moves in and they stay in a, a second year. At the end of that second year, you do have to start accruing interest on their security deposit. You don't have to do that during the first two years. But at the end of the second year, yes, you do have to begin accruing interest on that deposit. Now, a lot of people misconstrue here is they think, well, I've got to pay that out then, don't I? Well, the answer, it depends. And, and where I've invested before, we don't have to pay them out. We just accumulate that accrued interest. And at the end of the time when they do move out, we give them their original security deposit back plus the interest that's accrued. That's how I do it. I know some landlords who send a check every single year for the interest on that security deposit, even though they might only be sending 26 cents, that seems kind of ridiculous to spend 50 bucks on a on a you know a 50 cents on a stamp, and you're only gonna and you're gonna be paying out uh, 46. It just doesn't make sense. So, in any case, uh, you should get your law and, and interpret it the way you feel is proper for your state. But these are just basic rules that are adhered to by most of the states. This is what I'm going over right now. Okay. Um, by the way, after five years of tenancy, um, you're not allowed to raise the deposits anymore. This is typical across most states. In other words, let's say during the first five years you raise your rents 
three times 20 bucks a piece. Yes, you can increase the security deposit by that $20 three different times. But once you get past five years, you cannot increase the security deposit anymore, okay, in most states. Uh, another thing to be, be uh, careful about is this. When a tenant moves out and you intend to keep their deposit or some portion of the deposit, in most states it's 30 days. In some states it's 45 days. Some states it's 60 days. Some states, states you only got 15 days to return whatever deposit you're going to give to the tenant or whatever portion you're going to give them. And if you don't return the whole deposit, you've got to notify them in writing. Excuse me, and analyze, or excuse me, um, document and itemize what you kept, why you kept it, and provide documentation to prove that you actually paid that money out to fix things. Okay, so just remember, generally speaking, 30 days, but your stake could be 45, could be 60, could be 15. You just need to look that up and find that out. Okay, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but if you um, if you make a mistake and a tenant is aware of their rights and, and responsibilities. They could sue you typically up to three times what's called treble damages, three times um, the security deposit, right? So just remember, the penalties are stiff. Okay, let's do a quick pause here and check for questions before I go into how to make more money on these things. So hang on one second. Let me bring up that panel and see who we have questions from. Oops. Okay, this is from John Barnes. Okay, uh, can you clarify how to handle tenants who have service animals? Does the current law pertain to dogs only? Um, uh, yeah, they're, they're actually called service animals, and we're going to cover that separately, John. But what, there's what's called protected classes. Okay, uh, generally there's uh, there's federal guidelines um, that all the states are able to interpret and add additional. Uh, classes, okay, what we call protected classes. So in other words, the obvious ones are race, sex, religion, um, familial status, which is are you in a family or are you single, things like that, handicap, okay, those are all protected classes. Was well, as a result of that, um, people who have service dogs are considered a protected class, okay. Um, matter of fact, we're talking about that next. So what that means is if you have somebody apply to one of your apartments, as long as it's you know your apartment meets their needs and suits their needs and they have a service dog you can't deny them uh, running your apartment if they have a service dog you can't use that as, as an excuse to deny them occupancy okay um, if you're willing to take their application and rent to them with or without a dog or a service animal which by the way does not have to necessarily be a dog I've seen other service animals um, you can't keep them out you have to actually uh, rent to them, okay? I'll talk about more of that here in a second. Um, but in any case, let me look for other questions before we continue. Uh, let's see, that was service dogs. <clears throat> okay, Dai is asking, do we need any other license to become a property manager? Uh, Dai, no, there is no license to be a property manager. There is a designation you can get, uh, property manager designation that you can get through NAR. But let me just step back and qualify this for a second, okay? In most states, um, well, and actually in every state, you can manage properties for one other person without having to have a license. They will let you. The states will let you do that. However, as soon as you add a second person, you now have to either have a broker's license yourself, with errors and emissions insurance and everything else included, or you have to have a broker of record in your office. Um, in other words, you can start your own management company even if you're just a regular agent and not a broker, but hire a broker of record to be your broker of record. So people do it all the time. Sometimes you may only have to pay them 500 bucks, and they just basically don't do much other than satisfy, satisfying a state requirement. Okay. So the bottom line is this: is either you do have to be a broker, or somebody in your in your business has to have a broker's license. And the state actually typically has to approve that. So, um, in any case, uh, let me just check for more questions here. Hang on one second. This is Alita. Hi, Alita. Nice to hear from you. Okay, uh, let's see. Don't rent to attorneys or anyone who works for a law firm. <laughs> Thanks, Alita. Yeah, they, yeah, they'll. Uh, there's all kinds of. You know, the thing is, you know, 
about attorneys, and one of my best friends is an attorney. Um, I will tell you that uh, regardless of your whether you're right or wrong, or even if you did things 100% correctly according to the law, and there's a, a court case comes up, um, attorneys know how to delay things. They know how to um, um, do all kinds of continuances and file all kinds of stuff to require you to respond and take up a lot of valuable precious time, energy, and money just to get you to quit and go away. So, so Elite is right. I mean, I, I never rented to an attorney. Um, okay, so Jackie has a, thing, a statement here about um, security deposits. Okay, uh, if the security deposit, it has to be in an escrow account in their name or our name. Um, so here, here's, here's what I do, Jackie. Um, I didn't set up a separate security deposit for every single tenant. Um, what I did do is I set them up by owner because most owners have multiple properties. Okay, and what you'd have to do is you have to have a ledger that that basically is an accounting of your escrow account. Okay, it has to be a ledger. Now, some people will set up individual escrow accounts, and I think that's a little bit of overkill. You can actually have one escrow account. Okay, and in there you have separate ledger entries, separate separate line items. Right. Um, um, for each security deposit, so that you can and, the, and you can track them. You can you know, how long they've been there. Did they earn any interest, et cetera, et cetera. As long as you can properly identify them and show your ledger for the account, okay, um, you can have multiple deposits in, in one account. But you got to document it correctly. Now, now I know some of you are thinking. I wonder if my state allows that. Always validate. Google your state landlord or tenant law and see what they will allow. I tell you, most cases that we've seen, if you interpret it correctly, you don't have to have an individual separate escrow account for every single um, escrow deposit. However, some people absolutely do do that. Okay, so good question. Okay, uh, this is from uh, Alita. All right, uh, so don't rent to attorneys or anyone who works for a law firm. Okay, we talked about that. Security deposit, that's Jackie Joshua. Hey Gary, can we download this book? Um, yeah, hey, hey Josh, if you go to the um, uh, member section, you can uh, uh, not the not the training not the not the training material unless you take the training program. You can certainly get it that way, but you can get the book for free if you go to the uh, My Investment Services website, go to the Silver Level Membership section. Um, all of you, I believe, get any books that we've written for free as being as, 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 as a gift for being a student. If you want to take the training program, Josh, um, just email me, email Beverly, call Beverly, because as a student, you actually get it for half price. Um, you literally cut costs in half by taking the training program uh, as, as a student in any other training program. So good question. Okay, Alita says, I'd rather rent to pets than kids just between you and me. Kids are protected. Uh, they are actually absolutely yeah okay so this is Alita okay Alita says my only eviction after 35 years just re recently and his mother was an attorney should have known better <laughs> oh my gosh oh god bless you okay so let's go back here let's talk about pets now years ago I used to have a pet policy that said no pets only to find out I actually had pets <laughs> and it would happen so frequently I mean because what happened is you it's pretty clear in your lease no pets no pets no pets and what happened is the boyfriend uh, would get the girlfriend a little kitty cat because he was in trouble or something right or he just wanted the maybe he's a new boyfriend and he's still buying flowers and stuff like that and he gets a little puppy dog nobody at all is thinking at all about the lease they just happy to see the little puppy dog show up okay you go by or send your maintenance man by to fix something or take care of something or shovel snow or cut the grass seeing all this poop all over the place and then you realize I got pets so what I learned to do is this I said okay I'm getting tired of, of, of this happening and it's costing me I bet I can turn this into a profit center and here's exactly what I did guys all right so keep this down write this down and take notes um, I started advertising pet friendly all right and I want you to think about this what it did was it actually repelled the bad pet owners, not all of them, but a lot of them, and it actually attracted the good pet owners because good pet owners, one, are looking for places that are safe, clean, reliable, and are pet friendly. Um, and I wouldn't say anything else. I would just say pet friendly. Now, when they would come to look at the apartment, I would ask them to bring their pet with them, okay? 
unless it's like a 20-foot python or something, you typically it's a kitty cat or a puppy dog, and they can bring it on a leash or in a, in a little cage. All right, so they actually actually see the pet. And what I would do is I let them see the apartment, let them let the pet out to run around, and let them get attached to the apartment. I said, okay, here's how our pet policy works. We have a separate pet application just for your pet. We treat them special. They're just like people. They're just like kids, right? And they're like, oh, this is pretty neat. And then on there, they'll see that we collect an extra deposit for that little pet, and we also collect extra rent for that little pet. Now, what I did was it would range between anywhere from $25 to $100 a month extra rent depending on the size of the pet and some other factors, okay? Um, I would always charge extra rent, or excuse me, extra deposit equivalent to um, half a month's rent, okay? So I get more deposit and I would get more rent. And at the end of, at the, end of the year, what I started realizing was I'm making more money by doing this. <clears throat> In other words, I was making so much more money on pet deposits and extra rents per pet, and that was per pet, by the way. So people had two dogs; they paid twice. That it far outweighed any occasional damage that ever occurred as a result of running to people with pets. It far outweighed it, and I made more money. So I basically turned a problem into an income-producing asset, which is, by the way. <laughs> Uh, the name of the other book in the training guide, training program, which is Turning Rental Problems into Real Estate Profits. By the way, if any of you are on here and you were uh, in the New York City RIA group, um, you actually get all of this. You get all five programs as part of your, we call it the Massive Passive Cash Flow Method, where we show you how to leverage everything you're doing to generate a lot of cash flow. Um, this all comes to you as a result of this. Carte blanche, no questions asked. Um, it, I don't know how Beverly dispenses it, but just know that you get all this information, all these training programs, actually for that one one price. Okay. So in any case, um, back to this. That's how I handle pets. And now, again, if you have a service dog, that's considered protected, and you you, you have to ask your. Uh, I never did this stuff with people who had service dogs. I just didn't want to get involved with it. Um, I would rent it to them and let them be in there and. No problems, no questions asked. Okay, most states will allow you to do that, um, but I would I would check with your state to see how they handle uh, service service animals. Okay. Um, okay, let's see here. Alita says brilliant. Oh, you're welcome, yeah, Alita. I got. There's lots more to this list. So just uh, Alita in the in the rental um, material. There's two different training programs: one buying rentals and one managing them. Um, all this stuff is in there. There's like 12 different ways to make money. Okay, uh, okay. Been told this is from Joe. Joe saying or asking. Okay, I've been told you can have pet deposits or pet surcharges, but not both. Um, yeah, in, in our state, we were allowed to do charge a deposit and extra rent. In most states, you can, Joe. But what you can do is you can go to your state board of realtors and ask that question, post a question, and they'll tell you their answer. Um, and all that stuff is actually published, so you can actually ask for and receive all that printed material. And by the way, which leads me to something else I want to tell you guys, a really nice big surprise you're coming up. We're in the process of loading uh, the real estate documents for every single state and province um, onto our member section. So every state's going to have the, the, the pre-approved lease, the pre-approved sales agreement, the pre-approved listing agreement, pre-approved buyer's agency agreement, all that stuff's going to be out there at your disposal and for your clients, okay? Um, so let's see here. Uh, let's see, uh, John Barnes. Okay, the problem with service animals is when it's a pit bull. Hey, John, good, good subject. So, guys, there are dogs that the insurance companies uh, deem as being dangerous. Okay, in fact, the insurance policies will be null and void. In other words, your property insurance on that property uh, will be deemed null and void. If it's discovered that you have one of those dogs, like a pit bull, German Shepherd, Doberman Pinscher, Rottweiler, and I think it's Chow is the other one. There's generally five that all the insurance companies agree on are considered dangerous dogs. Um, <clears throat> so you have to be careful in your in your when you have people come apply, and that's why you want to bring the dog with them. Okay, in the case of dogs, all right, um, you can see what kind of dog it is. And you can tell them right there on the spot, you know what, the insurance companies do not uh, provide insurance in case case, I'm sorry, I can't rent to you. Now what John's asking here is more specifically, let's say that they're using a pit bull as a service animal. 
the question is, is what law, what, what, uh, what comes first? Um, and I would say it depends <laughs> on your judge and your attorney if it ever goes go to court. Um, I will tell you federal law always supersedes state law, which supersedes local law. Federal law also overrides any particular, um, um, you know, a zoning ordinance or, or, or a policy from a corporation. So uh, my understanding is, uh, just my opinion, that the ADA law, American Disabilities Act, um, overrides what the insurance companies are saying. Now, how that looks like in real practice, I, I couldn't tell you. You've got, to, you've got to talk to an attorney in your area, and it could open up a real can of worms here. Um, in any case, so David uh, Swanson is asking, okay, how do you verify an animal is an official service animal? Um, they should have, well, again, there's the laws have gotten so goofy in the last couple of years. The owner is supposed to be able to provide documentation showing that the service animal is a service animal. However, some attorneys have construed the, the um, uh, discrimination law such that you can't ask them if, they, if that dog is a service dog. You can't ask them for the paperwork, which seems kind of screwy. You know? And we, the, we, the reason they came up with that is, is um, like you can't ask somebody, a tenant, if you have children. Okay, that can be considered discriminatory. What you should ask them is, how many bedrooms do you require? And then they will tell you, oh, I've got three kids. Okay. Um, in the case of a service animal, most, I've never had, ever not had this happen. The tenants who come up with service animals always come prepared to prove that that is a service dog right off the gate. In fact, they're instructed from the ADA to do that. So I've never had it be a problem. Just be aware um, that they do have, uh, uh, they should have documentation to present to you, um, and if they don't present it to you, be, be careful how you ask the question. <laughs> okay. Um, and above all, remember, guys, I'm not an attorney. All right. Okay. So back to this. Um, as you can see, I turned a, a, a problem into a profit center, which leads me to the next subject, which is smokers. Okay. Um, I learned years ago that from time to time, even though I had a non-smoking policy, I actually ended up inheriting smokers or the boyfriend remove in, the boyfriend's a smoker, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so I did the same thing. I said, okay, I'm going to turn it into a profit center. And smokers are not a protected class, by the way. And even in states where they've allowed this, the use of marijuana, Cal you know, California, Colorado, I forget the other ones, not a protected class. So what I used to do is I'd say no smoking and people would still smoke. I said, okay, I'm going to advertise smoker friendly, all right? And not every building, or not every not every duplex or fourplex or single family home, but certain ones, um, I would advertise as smoker friendly. And what I did was I would charge them an extra deposit because everything had to be basically um, stripped down, stripped bare at the end when they move out to get rid of the odor. And uh, by the way, I would tell you, the uh, nicotine can be very damaging. We've had we we've had a, units where. We couldn't get that nicotine off those walls for nothing. We tried everything, every material that, that's known to man, bleaching the whole nine yards. We ended up having to, in one case, paint the walls black, completely black, and then prime them back to white. White, you know, primer is almost always white. And that's what we did. It took a lot of money. So I charged extra deposit, and I would charge um, extra rent, okay? Um, because sometimes neighbors would complain, blah, 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 blah. It would uh, get into the carpets, get into the drapes, everything, right? Um, that's what I did with smokers. Uh, also, let's see here. Here's we talk about protected classes. Um, just remember, guys, uh, the only thing that matters in, in the real estate business is green. You know, are these folks um, able to pay their rent? Are they qualified financially? And if they are, let them in. If they're not, don't let them in because financial status is not a protected class. If someone's too broke and can't afford your property, you don't have to rent to them, okay? And no, you, don't, you do not have to rent to, to people receiving a subsidy, all right? Now, if you own a building that is part of your purchase agreement and part of the deed and part of your loan says that you're going to make a certain percentage available for subsidized uh, subsidy recipients, then yeah, you've got to follow, you got to do that, right? But if it's always study um, you go to your state. Remember, there's federal guidelines for uh, uh, civil rights, um, but you've got to go to your state to see their particular. If they add any, if they can add classes. 
They can't take away, they can't, they can't eliminate a class, protect the class, but they can certainly add them, okay? So you want to do that. I'm not going to go over them here because you can do that on your own. Um, you can see ADAs in here, and I will tell you this, guys. Believe it or not, ADA is another profit center. Okay, now don't take this the wrong way. I'm not looking to exploit uh, unfairly people who are handicapped. What I'm telling you is this. I learned early on that ADA sometimes will provide grants to the tenants to have things like wheelchair ramps and safety bars added for their convenience to a unit that they're renting. And what the ADA does is give you a piece of paper you sign that says, yep, I'm willing to allow these modifications. And in that paper, it actually will say those modifications will be undone at the time the tenant moves out and your unit will be brought back to its original condition. I'm like, holy smokes, I'm going to go for that, not just because of that, but because they pay for the, the modifications. You don't have to pay for them. And in a lot of jurisdictions, their rents for ADA accessible properties are up to three times more standard or market rental rates for the area. So let me ask you guys, do you want to have rentals you're earning three times prevailing rates, and you can you can have a contractor come in and make the property ADA compliant at no cost to you. Believe me, I think the answer is yes. At least in my case, it was. Um, and you're providing a valuable service. In some areas, they're short. They need ADA compliant units, and you can provide them and actually command more rent. Okay. Now I would always leave the the, the modifications there, even when the people move out, because I can attract other um, other disability people, folks with disabilities. Okay. All right, next subject, and I want to get through at least one or two more before we call it quits for the day. Maintenance and repairs, yep, it can be a headache, but it can also be a profit center. So let me let me just describe this to you, and I'll let you sit on it and, and dwell on it for a moment. Okay, you, what I did when I first started my property management company, like a lot of other property management companies is, um, I would just take care of maintenance and repairs, uh, not the cost of them, but the actual managing of maintenance and repairs, is part of my management contract. And I realized, man, it's taken up a lot of time, and I'm doing all kinds of extra stuff. I'm providing 1099s, I'm providing accounting, scheduling, you know, ac granting access, all this stuff. Okay? So what I did was I said, you know what? Um, I don't, I'm not going to charge the, the owners of the properties 10%, which was a lot of companies do. They charge a 10% override on maintenance and repairs. They were charging owners. What I did was is I wanted to shield my owners from this, okay? <clears throat> so what it is, I charge the vendors, the plumbers, the electricians, the roofers, the contractors, the carpet cleaners, all these people. If I'm going to give them all this business and I'm going to provide them 1099s and I'm going to ensure that they get paid, okay, I'm going to charge them a 10% override. So I charge the 10%, but I would charge it to the contractors. That's what I did. So I got an extra 10% override on all maintenance and repairs, and I collected it from the contractors. All right? That's how I handle that. I want to run that by because that's a real eye-opener for a lot of people. Um, all right, real quick, let me check for questions here uh, before we get too much further because I jumped into the next subject there, and I want to make sure that we're all caught up. Okay, so Michael... <coughs> Okay, Michael's asking, how much would you charge smokers as an extra charge? So, Michael, what I would charge them an extra half month for a security deposit for cleaning purposes. And I, and I would also charge them if it was like a, um, you know, it depends on the size of the unit. Let's say it was a small one-bedroom apartment, and I might charge them an extra 25 bucks a month. But let's say it's a um, three-bedroom. I would charge them 50 bucks extra per month. And you know what? I would just ask for it, and by golly, they would pay it. You know, if they don't pay it, you know you're charging too much. Um, but I would basically ask for what I thought was fair to cover my cost should they actually do some damage, um, and, uh, and and they would pay it. Okay, so good good question. Um, let's see, somebody's asking here. Let's see, this is uh, hang on one second. This is Jackie. Okay, uh, do you need to have a lease renewal sign? Um, what I did, Jackie, another profit center. Is every I used to I used to not do this. I let the lease. It was an auto renewable lease. It automatically renewed every year, unless one or the other party notified the other party within 60 days. Okay. What I started doing after this, I realized it's a profit center. So now I charge a lease renewal fee on the anniversary date. So I'd have the people. Um, it was a convenience. We we was we would have them come in, or we would go uh, visit them. It just depend on what was working. 
for that particular area, what type of property it was and what area it was located in. Um, but I would charge them a lease renewal fee, and I do it every single year. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see here. That was that. We got that question out of the way. All right. So maintenance and repairs. We talked about that. Um, let's go down to the next thing and see how far we can get here. Um, and a matter of fact, I, I want to get to nuisance calls because I want to I want to tell you guys um, you're going to have tenants from time to time who are just going to call you, and here it is, nuisance calls, right? They're going to call you for every little thing, all right? Um, you know, the neighbor's dog is barking, blah 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 blah. Um, I you know just just nuisance stuff, okay? And what I learned to do is, if I charge them a nuisance call fee. I would stop. I would stem the flow of the nuisance calls. I would tell them in my in my lease. Okay, if these calls are deemed to be a nuisance, all right, they're 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 non they're not uh, important calls. They're just you know complaining about the neighbor's dog. There's nothing I can do about that. After the third call, I would start charging him a nuisance call fee of twenty five dollars, and you'd be amazed at how the call volume had dropped. Okay, um, I give you an example. I had a tenant one time call. Because they had the furnace turned up to 90, and it wasn't 90 degrees in the apartment. I'm like, I didn't know this in the phone call. I sent the HVAC guy out there. He called me and said, "Hey Gary, it's like 85 degrees in that apartment. They got the thing maxed out at 90, and the furnace is just it doesn't it'll it'll burn up. It's not going to go that high. That you're going to burn everything out." And I told the people, I said, you know, normal living conditions is right around you know 68 to 72 degrees. You got this thing up to 85, and he said, "Well, but we want it hotter because we're cold." And I said, well, first off, put some clothes on because they were running around there with practically nothing on. I went up, actually went to see the place to see for myself. And I said, you're going to burn this furnace out. You can't do that. If you do, you're going to have to pay for a furnace. Number one, I said, number two is if you call again, because this is like the third or fourth time, I'm going to charge you a nuisance call fee. And believe it or not, the calls stopped. Okay? So that's nuisance calls. Um, and I could give you all kinds of examples of stories. But let's do this. I want to, before we get into maintenance, excuse me, buildings and improvements, I want to give you another idea or two here that you can lose. We talked about renewal fee. All right, we talked about pet fee. We talked about uh, smoker fee. I also want you to recognize you can also charge an application fee, which you should, because when someone applies to rent one of your units, um, you want to check them out. You want to screen them for, you know, credit, uh, job history. Public record and where they've lived, right? At least that four, those four. You should charge an application fee to everybody who's 18 years or older. Okay, one fee per person. That's another way to make money. You can also charge a leasing fee to the owner. Let's say you do lease a vacancy. Um, you would typically charge the equivalent of one month's rent for that unit. Now, if you're in a high placed area, um, like parts of LA and parts of New York, yeah, you might only charge a half a month's rent for a leasing fee, okay? But if you're in an area where you're making a thousand bucks a month on rents, you should be charging a full month's rent for leasing fee. Right? That, that's what I would suggest. So there's leasing fees, there's lease renewal fees, there's application fees, there's um, pet fees, there's smoker fees, there's remember you can charge on maintenance and repairs to your vendors, okay? Um, there's you can, ADA, we talked about that, providing an ADA compliant unit, okay? Uh, you can make extra money on those. Um, also, let's say you, you are managing properties for others and you're taking on a new client. And let's say that new client has multiple properties. Well, it's going to take some time, effort, and energy to onboard the new client and onboard the new properties into your systems. In other words, load them up, type them, type them up, and get the information in. You might have to go visit the units. You might have to change locks. You might have to do all kinds of stuff, like uh, like uh, signing leases or writing new leases. All this stuff is extra work over and above the normal call of duty for managing rentals. So you should charge an on onboarding fee for brand new clients. Now don't make it so ridiculous that you're not going to get new clients. Make it reasonable. Tell them, hey, it's just a hundred bucks. That's all. Okay. Um, in any case, I wanted to give you those ideas to ponder because when you have, so when you manage rentals for others, guys, this is what I'm driving at the final analysis here. Let's say you're really interested in yourself in accumulating your own rentals. Most of you want to accumulate your own rental portfolio. Let me ask you this question. Would it be safer to acquire rentals uh, on the outside from the open market or would it be more 
less risky, would it be safer to acquire rentals from a portfolio that you're already managing for other people? And just type in your answer there. Yeah, you got it. There's a lot of yeses. That's exactly right. So one of the best things you can do to acquire good rental properties is to manage them for others. And when they from time to time want to sell, you say, look, I think I might like to buy that one. Because nobody knows that property and the tenants better than you because you're the one managing that property for that person. And I want to leave it at that. But before we go, let's check for other questions here because I just want to really open up your horizons as far as um, what's possible when you do this. When you, when you, and by the way, those, ten, those owners of the properties, another stream of income is obviously they're always looking to buy and sell more properties, and you get all those commissions from that too. Okay, so Jackie's asking, our, let's see, sorry, uh, the renewal fee will be the same as the rent increase. No, 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 the renewal fee is um, the, the privilege to renew the lease for another year. It's a, it's a fee, um, you know, it, it's just a, it's another profit center. The increased rent is really goes to your owner. The increased rents go to the owner and you get it maybe 10% of that. With the leasing fee, excuse me, the lease renewal fee, you generally keep yourself, all right? All right, so Jackie's asking, Jackie's asking, how much would you charge for property management? So Jackie, boy, it varies. I mean, I have seen it as down as low as 5% and as high as 12%. I've actually seen 20% management fees in some resort areas. So what you got to do, Jackie, is I recommend you go, you find your local apartment association and go to one of their events. Usually you can go for free for the first time and check around and see what other people are asking for their standard monthly management fee. You can also call them, call the management companies around your area and say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in this. Um, I'm gonna be investing myself. What can I generally expect to pay for a management fee? And see what they say. Okay, you're, you're, it'll run the gamut, but you wanna gather information by doing that. Okay, this is uh, Michael. Michael is asking, what would you charge property owners for managing their property? Well, that's the same question. Yeah, hey, Michael, it really it varies, man. I mean, by the way, it also can vary based on the type of property. So in other words, I might charge, um, if I'm managing a duplex way out, out of my area and it's the only thing out there, I might charge them 10%. Um, if I'm managing a duplex inside an area where there's there's uh, the tenants are receiving a Section 8 subsidy, I might charge 12% because Section 8 is going to create more work for you, the property manager. So if there's a subsidy involved, just be aware you're going to have to work more and you should charge more for uh, properties that are being rented to uh, subsidized tenants, okay? Um, let's see. Next, this is Penny. Okay, is this the only topic for tonight? Yeah, Tenny, we're pretty much done. We generally do these in about an hour. Some, I know we're running a little bit late here tonight. Um, so we generally try to focus, Peggy, on just one topic per night so we can dig in real deep. In fact, I haven't even got through all this. Right? We're going to have to do some more of this. Um, but Peggy, if you've got something specific you want to talk about, absolutely, please send me an email. Um, you know, it's Gary at myinvestmentservices.com. And I'll prepare for that for the next webinar. We'll go over that. That's how this works. So um, open forum, open mic. And I appreciate the input. And I appreciate you guys being so involved tonight. Some excellent, excellent questions. Um, God bless you all. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Jackie. And, uh, and Peggy, too. Um, and again, if, you, if you're ready for, you know, a lot of you were saying, I want to, like somebody was asking about the material on this subject tonight. Just go to the website, get the book first. Okay, read it. And if you want to go further with it and really develop this as part of your um, your uh, platform that you're offering your, your clients, take the program, get it for half price while you can, and open up another line of business for yourself. I mean, you, you can't imagine. I can't even begin to tell you how powerful this is. It, I made more money doing this than I did on brokers. Okay, let me put it that way. Um, you're welcome, David. Good to, good to hear from you, too. Good to a great call the other day, by the way. Um, all right, guys. Oh, let's see. Uh, it looks like there's one more question here. This is from Sarah. Sarah, what were the four screening criteria? Okay, so Sarah, the four things are this: um, credit, uh, public record, which is your. It's the second one. Public record, which is your criminal records. Okay, the public records office. Third one is your job history. And the fourth one is what we call domicile, where they've lived and how long they lived there. They're, they're actually. Uh, 
tenancy history. And if you, um, I used to do this for people. I stopped doing it because all the rules started getting kind of crazy. But there's um, there's other there's companies out there, national companies that will do tenant screening for you, for a fee. You can you can become a member of a local of a local credit agency, and get credit checks done real cheaply. But you definitely want to know all four of those checked out. You want to know if they have a public record, uh, what it's been like, where they've lived, how long they lived there. Um, public and uh, excuse me, job history of course. And what we're looking for is somebody that's had a job for at least more than a year, very consistently, and people who lived in their property, the last rental for say three years could be less, but definitely no no less than a year. Um, their credit history, like how they if they're not paying their electric and gas bills, they might not be too inclined to pay you. And of course, their um, you know um, so public record credit. Uh, job and where they live. Those, those are the four things. So, good question. Okay, guys, I'm going to drive from um, Long Beach to the big town of Industry, California. Okay, oh, Elita's, we got one more question. I'm sorry. Elita's asking, can you advertise that a unit is ADA compliant? You know, Alita, I don't know the answer in New York. I don't see why you can't. That's not discriminatory. You're simply making people aware that your, your unit is ADA compliant. I advertised it. I did. I had no problem with that. I never never ever once received a complaint, people were thrilled that it actually had a, a ADA compliant units. So I'd say the answer is absolutely yes. I don't see anything discriminatory in that at all. You're not saying you're eliminating other people. What you're saying is that ADA people can find, ADA uh, people who have disability will find a home in your place because you made it compliant. I think that's a good thing. Um, okay guys, hope you have an awesome night, awesome rest of the week. We will see you next week, which will be on the 11th again, actually, and I will be um, up in Pismo Beach, central central coastal California area, all right? Um, so in any case, I look forward to seeing you guys, and uh, Alita, you're welcome. I appreciate the feedback, and let me know what you guys want to discuss, because I make these these things are for you. Um, I'll provide all the information you want. You just got to let me know what you have questions on. All right, guys, take care of yourselves, and we will see you next week. God bless you all. Bye-bye.